Hey everybody, this is Russ from Metro Game Core. I just got back from holiday vacation yesterday. I've been away for the past couple weeks. Happy New Year, by the way, and you're looking great. Now, I plan on doing a video about that experience later on this week, but before that, I wanted to do a review video of this device. This is the Ambernic RG35XXH. The reason why I'm gonna do this first is because this device is actually launching tomorrow. And so I wanna give at least some impressions and an initial review about this device before it goes live. Now, this is really just a horizontal form factor of another device I reviewed last month, which is the Ambernic RG35XX+. These names are just terrible. Anyway, the thing about this device is that I didn't do a full review on it because it still has some software work that needs to be done. The stock operating system is going to be the same between these two devices, and it's workable. You can definitely launch your games, you can add new games, delete the old ones out, but I still think that there's a lot of work that can be done on the community side. And that's actually going to be an entire section of this video. We're going to talk about community software and Amronic in general. And so in this video, we're going to focus really on the hardware aspects of the RG35XXH, how do the buttons feel, how are the ergonomics. We'll also try to push the performance as far as we can just to see how much it will play. And in the end, I think that'll give you a pretty good idea of whether or not you want to pre-order it. Anyway, without any further delay, let's go ahead and jump in. Okay, let's get started with the specs. This is running the all winner H700, which has four A53 cores, and it also carries the same internal GPU and one gigabyte of RAM that we found in the RG35XX+. It also has the same display. We're looking at three and a half inches, 480p resolution with a four by three aspect ratio. We also have the same size battery, 3,500 milliamp hours. I got about six hours of gameplay when I was really pushing it, but about eight hours on average when playing most games. It also comes in at a fairly svelte 182 grams, which is a little bit over six ounces. In terms of connectivity, we've got the work. So 2.4 and five gigahertz Wi-Fi bands. And we've also got Bluetooth 4.2, a mini HDMI out port, as well as a headphone jack. And then finally, in terms of operating system, this is running a Linux-based firmware. Now, the retail price on this will be $68 plus shipping, so really about $75 altogether. And for the first couple days, they'll have a $5 off discount, so you can get it for even cheaper. Now, there are three different colors. There's a transparent white and purple, then also a black color. I don't have the white one to review, but I have the other two colors, which we'll look at later in this video. Now, the device will come with a 64 gigabyte SD card that's going to be preloaded with a bunch of games. And for about $15 more, they will send you a larger SD card, but I have always found those to be poorly organized, so I don't recommend doing that and instead just sourcing your own ROM files. Next, we'll move over to the unboxing. Now, this is a review unit sent over from Ambernic, but as always, all opinions are my own and no money was exchanged in any way. Inside the box, you will get a screen protector as well as an instruction manual, and then it'll also come with a USB-A to USB-C charging cable. Taking a look at the device itself, we have the black color to look at first, and this has a very classic Ambernic look to it. This is the same kind of design they've been using with a lot of their handhelds going back about three years at this point. In terms of plastic texture, this is very similar to the RG35XX+, Plus, and it has a more matte or powdery kind of finish to it. I really like the feel of it. It also has the traditional Ambernic rubber pads here on the back, and they've been doing this for years at this point. Essentially, it allows you to lay it flat onto the table and it won't move around too much. Going back to the front, I really do like this traditional Ambernic design. I think it's very sleek and compact, and I like the fact that they don't have the Ambernic logo on the front either. Now let's take a look at the controls, starting with the face buttons. Right off the bat, we have glossy buttons. This has kind of been their MO for the past year. And personally, I like the feel of them, so no complaints there. The buttons themselves have a rubber membrane connection, much like with their other devices, so it has a more classic retro feel to it. And yes, these are very typical Ambernic buttons, which is a good thing. I think they make some of the best buttons for retro handhelds. Next, let's move over to the D-pad, again with a rubber membrane connection, so very similar to other Ambernic devices. And it does have that classic retro bounciness to it as well. Now, the rubber membrane does feel a little bit soft or loose to me compared to other Ambernic devices I've tested before. So let's do a couple software tests to see how it really plays out. We're going to start with the Street Fighter test, so here I want to make sure the D-pad is Hadoukenable and Shoryukenable. And when doing these motions on the D-pad, it feels great. I've got no problem here playing any sort of Capcom or Street Fighter style game. The next D-pad test I always like to do is the Contra test. So here I'm going to press down on the D-pad and then wiggle it left and right. And my hope here is to get minimal movement. But unfortunately, as you can see, the character is moving all over the place. And so unfortunately, this does mean you'll probably have a high rate of false diagonals when you're trying to press up, down, left, and right, but instead you hit a diagonal. And this was a pretty common problem in the original RG35XX and something that they fixed with the Plus model last month. 
When doing the contra test on this device, it was clearly better. The character moved only a little bit, and it was much better for precision type playing. And so unfortunately, the diagonals on this device have taken a step back from the RG35XX+. Now in general, I still think that the D-pad is going to feel very good, but there will be certain games like Contra and other platformers where this will probably not be ideal. So in all, I would say the D-pad here is pretty decent, but there are going to be some issues with those diagonals if you are sensitive to them. Now above that, we have our select and start buttons. These are very classic Ambernic and the fact that they have a rubber membrane connection, and yeah, they feel just fine. So next, let's move over to the analog sticks. Now, these are Nintendo Switch-style Joy-Cons, and even though Amernick has lately been moving towards hall sensor-based analog sticks, these are not them. And that kind of makes sense for me, given the fact that this is a more budget-minded handheld, and in terms of range of motion and just overall feel of the joysticks, I think they are pretty typical from what you would expect from these retro handhelds. Next, we'll take a look at the bottom. So we have dual stereo speaker outputs, and then we have two micro SD card slots. Like I mentioned, this one will already come with a 64 gigabyte card, but you can also expand the storage with the second card if you would like. Now the stock card looks to be just a generic 64 gigabyte micro SD. And like I mentioned, it'll be preloaded with a bunch of games. And that's what I'm gonna be using my testing here in this video. Let's take another look at the back. Not a lot going on here other than the logo, which I wanted to mention. And so let's now move over to the top. We're gonna to start by talking about the inline shoulder and trigger buttons. And while I do prefer stacked shoulder buttons on most handhelds, I don't really mind it on this and similar devices, just because it does make the handheld quite a bit more pocketable. Let's do a quick audio test to see how loud these buttons are compared to the face buttons. So overall, I would say these shoulders and triggers are definitely more on the clicky side and a little bit louder than the face buttons, but not by much. Looking at the rest of the top, we have a headphone jack on the far left, and then we have two USB ports. Both of these can be used for OTG or for peripherals, and also the one on the right will be used for charging the device. In the center, we have a mini HDMI port, and then on the far right, we have our function button. This will work as a hotkey button in most emulators. And then finally, on the right side, we have our power and reset buttons, and then on the left, we have our volume up and down. Next, I want to do a quick size comparison against other Ambernic devices. We're going to start with the RG350P. Now, this one came out a few years ago, but still retails for around $80. And I think between the two, there's really no comparison. The RG350P has a slower chipset, a lower resolution screen, and is also quite a bit thicker as well. Not only that, the operating system is quite old and clunky by today's standards, and we're actually going to talk a little bit more about this firmware later in the video. Before that, let's compare the 35XXH against other Ambernic devices. Next up is going to be the RG351P. Now this one also came out about three years ago and is still quite expensive. I think it retails for about 100 bucks. And believe it or not, this is the last three and a half inch rectangle shaped plastic horizontal handheld that Ambernic has made. And so in many ways, the 35XXH is kind of a successor to the 351P. Now between these two, there have been other rectangular horizontal handhelds released by this company, but they've all been metal. For example, there's the RG351MP, which uses the same RK3326 chipset as the 351P, but this one's made out of aluminum, and it's also quite a bit more expensive. I think it retails for around 150 bucks. So really, this device is twice as expensive as the 35XXH, but not as powerful. Now another handheld with a similar form factor and power performance as the handheld we're reviewing today is the RG3 353M. And this one's also made out of aluminum and quite expensive. It's around $150 as well. And then finally, the most recent rectangular handheld that they've created up until today has been the RG405M. Now this one is quite a bit different. It runs an Android-based operating system and is more powerful. And it has a 4-inch screen compared to the 3.5 inches we've seen for all the other handhelds we've been comparing it with. Now while I've been a big fan of all these metal handhelds that have released, they have a nice premium feel to them. I've always preferred to have a plastic handheld. I've been asking for this for years at this point, and so I'm really excited to see it with the 35XXH. Next, I want to talk about the pocketability and overall thickness of this device because it is surprisingly thin. For example, at its thinnest point, which is near where the screen is, it's under 17 millimeters. And even at its thickest point, when you account for the rubber pads at the back and the analog sticks, it's still about 20 and a half millimeters altogether. As a comparison, here's the RG35XX Plus at its thickest point, which is about 5mm thicker. 
And so let's do a quick comparison between these two devices when it comes to pocketability. As I mentioned before, these have the exact same chipset and software, so the only difference here is the form factor. Now the horizontal version does have analog sticks as well as stereo speakers, so if that matters to you, this will be better. And in terms of size, the H model is taller but thinner. And I found the difference between the two actually works out in my favor with the horizontal version. For me, I like something that's thinner and lightweight and easy to pocket, and in all three of those factors, this one really works well. In fact, putting this in my pocket is very similar to using a cell phone, so if you're used to putting a cell phone in your pocket, it's going to be a very similar experience. Meanwhile, even though the RG35XX Plus is pocketable, I've never really found it ideal. And a lot of that comes from the protruding shoulder buttons here on the back. Now, 5mm of difference is not a huge amount when it comes to thickness, but if anything, I would say that when putting the 35XX Plus in my pocket, I can definitely tell that it's there, and I would say that that wasn't as apparent with the horizontal version. So between the two, I would prefer the H over the Plus. Now, of course, the 35XX Plus still has a lot of great things going for it. It's really compact looking and has that Game Boy style nostalgia. So if you do want a handheld with a vertical orientation, I still think this one's pretty great. But between the two, I think it's no contest when it comes to pocketability as well as comfort. But just to clarify, I do prefer horizontal handhelds over vertical ones, so this is really no surprise to me. Now that being said, I don't think the controls and ergonomics on this device are perfect. There are a couple nitpicks. To start, let's talk a little bit more about these inline shoulder buttons. And I think when it comes to just overall gameplay, these buttons work out pretty well when you need to press on something here and there. But there will be some certain context where it's not ideal, particularly when trying to use the trigger buttons and the analog sticks at the same time. Now this will probably be pretty rare depending on the game that you're playing on this device, but one good example is going to be Cruising USA. In this game, you have to hold on to L2 while using the left analog stick at the same time. And I've never really found this to be a comfortable setup, so I would recommend going into the RetroArch settings and remapping the gas pedal to a different button. Anyway, if there are games where you're trying to press the triggers and the analog stick at the same time, yeah, it's probably not going to be great. I also think that this setup is not ideal when it comes to playing dual analog stick games. For example, here with the Quake port, having both analog sticks on the bottom with such a small device is actually quite uncomfortable, so this is something that I wouldn't really enjoy either. But like I mentioned, you'll probably be playing D-pad centric games anyway, and so this may be a rare occurrence with this particular handheld. Another thing that's a little bit weird when it comes to ergonomics is that function button on the top right. And with this stock operating system, this is going to be your default hotkey. And so when it comes to enabling fast forward, you have to press that function button as well as R2 at the same time, which is a little bit awkward. Same thing with closing out of game, you'll press the F button and start at the same time, it just takes a moment to get used to it. And really, these nitpicks are not the end of the world, but I did want to mention them here in this review. Next, we'll talk about weight. So this is 182 grams, which is pretty darn light for a handheld like this. In fact, it's a few grams lighter than the RG35XX Plus, and of course, it'll be significantly lighter than any of the other horizontal metal handhelds that we were talking about earlier. And I think that's probably one of my favorite things about this device, is how thin and compact and light it is altogether. It's been years since Ambernick has made a plastic handheld like this, and so I'm really happy to see it. Now let's take a look at the other review unit they sent over, which has the transparent purple color. And they've used this color with other handhelds previously, so no surprises here in the fact that it looks like an atomic purple Game Boy Color. I do like the fact that the purple they're using isn't very saturated, so it has a subtle kind of look to it. And so it'll really be up to you which colorway you prefer. However, I should note that the texture on the plastic is a little bit more glossy on the transparent model than it is on the matte one. But I would say it still has a nice amount of grip to it as well. One thing of note, after a couple days of using the black model, I did get some smudging here on the back. So I would say if you're getting the black model, you're probably going to want to wipe this down every once in a while if these smudges bother you like they do for me. Anyway, between the two, I think I prefer the black model, so that's what we're going to use for the rest of this video. Now before we jump into the software section, I do want to do a quick audio test, and I'm capturing this at a 100% volume at ear level in an untreated room. Now admittedly, I don't have huge expectations when it comes to audio quality, but I still think this is pretty decent for a 75-ish dollar handheld. So now let's move over to the software experience using the stock operating system. And like I mentioned before, this is the exact same experience that we found on the RG35XX Plus, but all the same, I will walk you through some of these main features here in this video. To start, it takes about 20 seconds to boot this device up, and this is what the main interface is going to look like. And I'd say the menu system here is pretty simple. There are two different ways to start up your games. The first on the left is going to be called Game Rooms. And within here you have a bunch of standalone emulators. And there's a bunch to choose from here, but the only 
two I actually recommend from the system are going to be for PSP and Nintendo DS. For everything else, I recommend going into the next section, which is called the RA game section. Within here, you'll have access to all the same games that we had previously, but these are going to launch using a RetroArch core. And so for everything else, except for PSP and Nintendo DS, I recommend using the RetroArch core instead. Overall, it'll give you a more consistent experience. Now in the next section, we have our favorites menu. And then after that, we have our history. So if you want to go back to recently played games, you can do that here. You also have the ability to search for games, and this is pretty intuitive. So for example, if we want to play a Kirby game, we can just start typing the word Kirby, and after a couple letters, the games will actually start showing up. So rather than trying to scroll through the entire catalog, this might be a little faster. Of note here, there are some games that are completely missing from this altogether. For example, they've removed every single game that has the word Mario in it, so you can't find any of those games, you'll have to load them up yourself. In fact, when looking through the games list, you will find quite a few omissions. For example, under the Super Nintendo catalog, there is no Chrono Trigger, and then of course, like I mentioned, anything with the word Mario in it will be absent as well. Now, adding and removing games is actually very easy. You can just pop out the microSD card, put it in your computer, and then you can add it into the corresponding folder. So if you want to add some of your favorite games, or there's a few in there that you're never going to play, you can remove those or add the others as you'd like. Now finally, the last section will be your settings options. And there's quite a few things you can change here, like the screen brightness or the date and time. And you can also go directly into RetroArch if you want to change out those settings within there. You've also got some network settings, including turning on Bluetooth and Wi-Fi. And there are a couple things you can do to change out the look of the user interface. But in the end, there's not a lot to choose from, very similar to the other RG35XX devices that were released previously. Now before we get into gameplay, I do have a couple tips that might help with the software experience. For example, when you're browsing browsing through a game and you find one that you like, to add it to your favorites, it's very simple. You just press the start button and you'll see a little star pop up when you've done it. And after that, you'll be able to find it within the favorites menu. And so this will be pretty handy if you have some select favorite games that you want to play a lot, but you don't want to navigate through the menu all the time. And of course, to remove it from the favorites list, all you have to do is just press the start button again. Another handy function is if you press the F button up top anytime in the menu, it'll take you to the settings section. And so this might save you a little bit of time depending on where you are in the menu. Also of note, the operating system is capable of a sleep mode. All you have to do is just tap on the power button, it'll go to sleep, you'll see the LED light still on. But if you tap on the button again, it'll bring it back up. Additionally, to turn off the device, all you have to do is just hold on the power button for a couple seconds. Now of note, when you're in a game and you tap the power button, it'll still go to sleep. But I wouldn't plan on doing this for a long time because it will eventually drain your battery. Either way, to wake it up from sleep, you press the power button again. And one last thing of note, if you power down while in a game, it will power back up, but it will not take you back to where you were in your game. So your options when it comes to quickly getting in and out of a game are somewhat limited. Okay, now let's move over to the game testing and I'll give a couple tips and tricks along the way. For example, when it comes to Game Boy, you can see that the colorization is not enabled by default. But this is a pretty easy fix because all you have to do is press the function button and it'll go into RetroArch. And from there, you can change out the options. So if we go into the core options and then under Game Boy colorization, we change that to internal. From there, you have a variety of options to choose from when it comes to colorization. And so here's what it looks like with the default DMG colorization, which I think looks pretty good. Anyway, when it comes to Game Boy and Game Game Boy Color games, they've actually done a fairly good job in setting these up. For example, they've enabled the core provided aspect ratio, which in this example is going to be 10 by 9. And so everything is going to look and play really well when it comes to Game Boy and Game Boy Color. And same thing with Game Boy Advance, this has the 3 by 2 aspect ratio enabled. And of course, this chipset can handle way more than Game Boy and Game Boy Advance, so let's keep moving on. Now when it comes to the home console systems from the 8 and 16-bit era, you know, things like NES, Genesis, and Super Nintendo, yes, these all play just fine. And I also think it's worth noting that the color balance and saturation on the screen looks really good too. Now moving over to arcade platforms, all your favorite 80s and 90s classics will probably play on here. And I think this is one of those times where having an analog stick comes in clutch because I love playing arcade games with an analog stick and so this is a really good fit. One thing worth noting, there's an entire vertical arcade game section within the menu and all these games have been pre-configured to work with the RG35XXH when flipped 90 degrees. And I found this to be pretty fun. The device itself is well balanced when turned like this, and it does make this screen a lot bigger for games when they're playing in Tate mode. So if you do want to play arcade games vertically, this is going to work out well. Next up, we're going to talk about PlayStation 1. All these games run just fine. Even the harder to play games like Tekken 3, yeah, no problem whatsoever here. Now when it comes to Nintendo DS emulation, all these games are going to play fine too, but I would say you're probably going to want to 
to focus on games that require seeing only one screen at a time and also don't require touch input. Either way, the full catalog of Nintendo DS games are going to play on this no problem. It's really going to come down to the control scheme and whether or not it's going to work out well for this particular setup. Next up we have Dreamcast, and there are quite a few games that are run at full speed. For example, with Soul Calibur, we're getting a full 60 frames per second. However, as you start playing some of the harder to run games, you will see the frame rate dip down, and at that point it'll start using a frame skip. What that means is the gameplay experience will still be relatively smooth, but it's not going to be perfectly accurate because it is skipping a frame here and there. All told, I would say that Dreamcast is going to be mostly playable as long as you're not trying to get a perfect play experience. Next up, we'll talk a little bit about PlayStation Portable. This is probably not an ideal device to use it on, but one thing of note, you'll have to go into the display settings and uncheck the stretch function, so that way it's going to show at the true 16 by 9 aspect ratio. Now, when it comes to performance, by default, they've actually turned on auto frame skip, so I turn that off in the settings, and I would say when turning off auto frame skip and keeping it at a native 1x resolution, about half the games in the catalog will be playable. You're still going to get some slowdown here and there, for example with Ridge Racer, but overall, I would say if you stick to lightweight and 2D games, it should be pretty good. And finally, let's talk about Nintendo 64. Now to start, I should mention that the 64 gigabyte card that comes with this device didn't have any games on it, so I did have to preload all of these myself. In addition, I had to go into the RetroArch options and change the core graphical backend to the Rice plugin. And this one gave me the best performance and many games played at full speed, for example F-Zero X and Mario Kart 64, and even some harder to play games like Killer Instinct Gold were actually pretty great. Now unfortunately, using the Rice plugin will cause some graphical issues here and there. For example, the graphics in Super Mario 64 will flicker from time to time, and other games like Mario Golf and Mario Tennis will basically be broken because they just look so bad. But really, when it comes down to it, performance is surprisingly good. Even Cruise in USA is very close to running at full speed. So if anything, I would say that maybe 75% of the Nintendo 64 catalog will be mostly playable. And having an analog stick to play these games is going to be pretty handy compared to the vertical version. Okay, one more thing to test is going to be the HDMI out function. And it's pretty plug and play. You just need a mini HDMI cable plugged into a monitor or TV. And the menu will actually scale to 16 by 9, so it looks pretty good on a big screen. Now when jumping into a 4x3 aspect ratio game, it's actually going to stretch it to the full 16x9, so you will want to go into these settings and change the scaling options. And I found for most of these 4x3 systems, the easiest thing to do is to change the aspect ratio to 8x7. This is going to push it to a more square aspect ratio, but when it gets stretched out on the screen, it's going to look very similar to 4x3. And so when it comes to playing classic retro games, that's what I've been doing. It's not a perfect solution, but it's pretty darn close. And for some of the wider systems like PSP, which ran at a 16x9, it's actually going to fill up the whole screen. However, playing PSP on a big screen is probably not going to be ideal with this device, mostly because you have to play it at a 1x or native resolution, and it's going to look pretty chunky here on the screen. Not only that, the really heavyweight games like God of War are just not going to play on this device. It's not quite powerful enough. So again, if you're choosy about what PSP games you play, you might get a good experience here, but I wouldn't really count on it. Now this device is also capable of Bluetooth, so let's test that out next. And this is pretty easy to set up, you just go into the menu, turn it on, and then search for a device. And sure enough, it picked up on my 8-bit Doe SN30 Pro first time. Now right off the bat, once you're connected, you'll be able to navigate the menu with the second controller. However, the Bluetooth controller will default to Player 2 in RetroArch no matter what. So depending on what type of game you're playing, you will have to go in and make more configurations to make this Player 1. However, if you are looking for a two-player game experience, where one person plays on the console and then player two uses a Bluetooth controller, this will be a perfect fit. However, just bear in mind that setting up your controller profiles within RetroArch is not super easy. And this is one of those things that a custom operating system will usually account for, but unfortunately the stock operating system didn't quite get it right. And that actually leads to the last section of this video where I want to talk about Ambernic and their software and how they've never really gotten this right when it comes to community development. Okay, to start, I want to talk about the historical context of Ambernic and their software. When I got my very first Ambernic device, which was the RG350 back in 2020, they were using an open source software called OpenDingX. And this was a Linux-based firmware that was a mishmash of a bunch of different standalone emulators. It was kind of a pain to navigate. In fact, that's why I started Retro Game Core in the first place. I thought it was awesome that there were a bunch of community-based emulator apps, but it was very hard to tell which one worked best for which platform. So I started working on guides and videos for that device, and then it just 
just kind of grew from there. Now, later in 2020, Ambernick released the RG351P. This one had an upgraded chipset, but also ran on emulation station. And I love this device. And a bunch of other developers got their hands on it and decided to start making firmware for it because they liked it too. And so a bunch of operating systems that you may have heard of before, ArcOS, Jealous, 351 Elec, which is now called Amber Elec, those all got their start with the RG351P. And it was around this time that these devices got really popular. And a lot of that has to do with the custom firmware that was made for it. These improved the operating system experience just so much over the stock firmware. And to be honest, this is one of my favorite times when it came to Ambernic devices. They would release a new one every three or four months, and then the custom firmware developers would get their hands on it, and they would try to make their firmware work for it, and it was just really cool to watch. Now, as time went on, Ambernic released more and more devices, and more quickly. We had new chipsets, new screens, things like that, to the point where community developers really couldn't keep up. Now, unfortunately, it was around this time that the relationship between these custom firmware developers and Ambernic started going sour. Now, there's a lot of reasons for it. I don't want to go into all the drama, but I will say that the custom firmware developers were asking for source code. They were basically wanting to make their development jobs a little bit easier, especially considering the fact that all this is supposed to be open source. They're not getting paid, you know, all that kind of stuff. Now, unfortunately, Ambernic does not share their source code, and it's probably a commercial decision in the fact that they don't want people cloning their devices. After all, if the software is out there in the open, then there could be other Chinese manufacturers who will make a similar handheld using that software. And that's pretty ironic given the fact that Ambernic's first devices, the RG350, 351 series, were all clones of previous devices that were open source. And unfortunately, things kind of came to a head where a bunch of these community developers decided they just weren't going to work with Ambernic anymore. And so that's kind of where we are today. We've got a device like the RG35XXH, and there are a bunch of very talented developers who can make some really great firmware for it, but they don't want to touch it. Now, that being said, there are some developers still working on Ambernic devices. We have the Retro Arena, Garlic OS is probably going to come to this device eventually, and we have others like Koriki and Mustard OS. So I'm not saying that there's never going to be custom firmware available for the RG35XXH. I just don't think that we're going to see something like Jealous or Arc OS coming to it at all, and it might be some time before we have a good working custom firmware for this device. And so when it comes down to it, we're kind of back in those old days where a device comes out and if it has good hardware and the community likes it, then maybe some developers will get involved and make some good software options for it. We've seen that happen before. For example, with the Miu Mini, we have Onion OS, which is a community driven project, which is just kind of amazing. And so in the end, I do hope we get a custom operating system for this device, but I'm not really sure how likely that's going to be given the track record of community developers with Ambernic. At this point, we've got some really great hardware. It's a horizontal device that I've been waiting for for years. It's nice and compact, good battery life, nice screen, good controls, all the things that I would really like. And unfortunately, the software is holding it back. Now, in previous videos, I've had a wait and see approach when it comes to Ambernic devices, just because the custom firmware usually comes out later on. And that's probably going to be the case here. But honestly, I'm getting a little tired of saying that in all of my reviews. I really wish that Ambernic would work with community developers before a device is released to come out with an operating system that just works on day one. And so that's what I mean when I say that Ambernic has a software problem. Their stock operating system has never been great, but their hardware has always been really good. But unfortunately, the gap between the two is getting wider and wider. And because a lot of community developers just don't want to work on Ambernic devices anymore, I don't really see this as being a good thing at all. Anyway, I wanted to sandwich this segment into this video here just because it seems to be the most apparent on the RG35XXH. This is a device that gets a lot of things right when it comes to hardware, but this software is definitely holding it back. Okay, with all of that out of the way, I think it's time to wrap up and start talking about what I like and what I don't like about the Ambernic RG35XXH. We'll start with what I like, and number one is going to be the size. I think that this is a perfect size for a smaller, pocketable retro handheld. Not only is it nice and thin and pocketable, but it is very lightweight, and so I think it's a perfect combo. I also think the performance here is pretty good for the price point. You can play all your retro systems all the way up to Nintendo 64 with some surprisingly good results. And I also think that for all the features we're getting, it's a fair price point, around $75 after shipping and all that. I'm also a big fan of this screen. I think the colors are good, it's nice and bright. And I think the size is pretty good. It's three and a half inches. I would prefer four inches, but all the same, I like that it's nice and compact. And I also find that the battery life is good, between six to eight hours, but more towards eight if you're going to be playing more retro games like Super Nintendo, things like that. And finally, it's got all the bells and whistles that I would want in a retro handheld, HDMI out, Wi-Fi, and Bluetooth. 
Now, like with others, this device is not perfect, so let's talk about some of the things I didn't like about it. Number one, it's going to be the D-pad. It's a little bit on the touchy side when it comes to diagonals. So if you are going to be playing a more precision-based platformer, you might have a couple times here and there where it's going to frustrate you. I also think the release timing of this device is a little bit weird. Just last month, they had the vertical one release, but they didn't say anything about the horizontal version. And I bet there's a lot of people out there who bought the vertical one who would have preferred to get a horizontal one instead and didn't really have the choice at the time. So if anything, I would say that if Amberdick is ever going to release devices that are so similar, so close to one another, they should just release them at the same time. Now, I've kind of already beat a dead horse about this, but I did want to bring up the software yet again, because time after time, Amberdick releases these devices that have really great hardware and kind of crummy software. And a few years ago, this was kind of exciting because it meant that the community could rally together and make something better. But I think a lot of people are just getting tired of the fact that Amberdick is not evolving when it comes to software. They're just doing the bare minimum, and unfortunately, I'm finding that to be more and more unacceptable. Another thing I wish was a little bit better with this device are the color options. We've seen these same colors before, and so I kind of wish that they went a little bit funkier. After all, this is a company that makes wood panel handhelds, so they could have done something a little bit more drastic here. And finally, I do think the RG35XXH is in a bit of a weird position at around that $75 price point. And that's because for a little bit more money, like $90, you can get a better handheld. I think the best example is actually going to be the Pow Kitty RGB30. This is one of my favorite devices of 2023, and for many reasons. Number one, the controls here are still pretty good. They do take a little bit of tinkering to get better, but it also has a better chipset and screen than the 35XXH, and it also has multiple mature custom firmware options available for it. And so while I do think that the price point on the RG35XX is fair, part of me thinks that you're better off saving your money for something a little bit better at a higher price point. So I guess in the end, what I'm really trying to say is that the RG35XXH is still a really good piece of hardware. But I do have some reservations about it when it comes to the software, to the point where I could consider this to be a daily driver when it comes to retro gaming. But I'm definitely not feeling that right here and now. I think we need to have better software, and until then, I'm not really going to recommend this device. Now, that being said, I think over time, this might turn into a gem of a handheld. And so if you are planning on picking this one up, I think it should be with the understanding that things will probably get better over time, but they're not perfect right now. With so many other options on the market right now, it's very hard to say that yes, this is a device you should get because it shows a lot of potential. Instead, if you're looking for the best experience right now, I don't think this is the best handheld to get. Instead, it might be better to get something a little bit older. After all, just because this is the shiny new handheld doesn't mean it's the best. Anyway, let me know what you think in the comments down below. Are you expecting to pick up this device and what is holding you back if not? As always, thank you for watching and be sure to like and subscribe if you found this helpful and we will see you next time. Happy gaming.